CTA in this minor stroke and high risk TIA population with these motor and speech symptoms. And the yield's about one in three to detect a major plumbing problem that's symptomatic. Okay? And when you identify those major plumbing problems, the risk of a recurrent stroke or progression of a stroke is about fourfold higher. So you can really identify or triage the group of patients that, that are at high risk. And so I'm just going to walk you through some examples of how we use it. So basically, if a patient's CTA positive, we admit those patients in every instance. If they're CTA negative, we actually can send them home, save a little bit of our healthcare dollars in Canada, and then we bring them back to the outpatient clinic for cardiac investigation and an MRI. You may want to use your, your extension of your emergency department for that sort of 24-hour stay uh, to do that MRI as an alternative in those CTA negative patients. But a direct admission to the hospital may be avoided in that circumstance. Uh, there are three different uh, clinical situations that I'll just, uh, or vascular situations I'll just highlight for you for out of interest. One is that we're now able to see the thrombus very well in, uh, with vascular imaging. This is something called the interluminal thrombus or free-floating thrombus or we're, we like to use the word donut sign. And this is seen on a CT angiogram in the neck. It's basically a donut hole where there's no contrast in the center where the thrombus is flapping in the breeze, surrounded by contrast. And uh, these, these, these clots are associated with very active embolization when you monitor them with transcranial Doppler. In fact, they have big emboli, okay? And uh, we can actually distinguish plaques from thrombi by their appearance. The, they typically have finger-like projections moving cranially on the CTA to see these clots. And there's some suggestion that certainly therapeutically we need to be more aggressive with these patients. We don't have RCTs yet, of course, uh, to specifically evaluating this, uh, this one problem. Another interesting thing I wanted to highlight for you because I think it's often not recognized is something called carotid webs. Uh, this is uh, work we've done where we've uh, um, seen a, a large series of these carotid webs in the neck. Uh, they have their fibromuscular dysplasia pathology and they typically are in young patients with cryptogenic stroke. And we have seen a ridiculous number of these sometimes have to have two thrombectomies over a six month period. They actually form a clot, that clot embolizes to the brain, we have to pull it out and then months later they've come back in with a second one. So you have to be on the lookout for these in young patients. A recent case control study sa suggests that if you take all your strokes, 10% of them are cryptogenic young strokes under the age of 60. In that group, at least one in 10 of those are carotid webs. So about 1% of all the strokes overall are carotid webs. Uh, and uh, we need to appreciate that. We, we typically treat these patients aggressively and we have had to actually remove the web in some circumstances due to uh, uh, them being medically refractory to do antiplatelet therapy, for example. And then the third group is actually intracranial occlusion. This is one I want to spend a, a couple minutes on. Uh, we don't think about intracranial occlusions in our mild stroke patients, but they do happen. In fact, about 10% uh, of mild strokes and high-risk TIAs have an intracranial occlusion on, on vascular imaging. Their risk of neurological deterioration is increased tenfold. I repeat, tenfold. So instead of having a 1% or 2% risk of deterioration, they're upwards of 20, 30, 40% risk of deterioration neurologically. And these are two prospective cohort studies where we evaluated this issue. So obviously, if they have an intracranial occlusion and a, and a mild deficit and it's disabling and they're under four and a half hours, you're going to give them TPA. That's, that's a straightforward sort of decision making. But what if they're non-disabling? I mean, what is the practice for these patients with, uh, with an occlusion and a very minimal neurologic deficit that's non-disabling? Well, we really don't know. We need more studies. We've looked at using T and K in this population. We wanted to use a drug in a dose that was particularly safe with low bleeding. So we did some dose escalation with TNK, and we've now applied this to a trial called TEMPO2, where we're randomizing very mild stroke patients with an intracranial occlusion on the CTA to TNK versus the standard of care right now, which is antiplatelet therapy in these mild patients. So hopefully we'll have an answer for you in the, on that trial in the next two or three years. One of the problems and challenges with mild stroke detection is it's really hard to see those blockage downstream on a CTA. One trick that we use that works quite well is we do multi-phase CTA, where we do neck and head imaging, so we scan the, the neck and head first on the bolus run, move the gantry back down and scan the head again eight seconds later, move the back gantry back down a third time, scan eight seconds later. So 
So we get three sets of images of the brain. And that allows us to see collateral blood supply, which is important for endovascular therapy. I won't even have time to cover that, but that's important there. But it also identifies what we call a hang-up of flow, where you, when you have a distal occlusion, there's a small region in the brain, okay, you can see it right there, where the, the, on the third phase of the CTA, this is about 16 seconds after the first phase, you see a hang-up of contrast. That's your sign that there's a distal intracranial occlusion in that patient. The other challenge is large vessel occlusions in mild strokes. It turns out about 10% of large vessel occlusions presenting early present with a low NI stroke skill score. And up to 30 to 50% that present late are, um, uh, have a low NI stroke skill score. The mild strokes tend to present a hospital a little bit later. They don't call 911. They often come in by private vehicles, so there's a bit of a delay. But so it's a significant and relevant population of LVOs. The problem is our current guidelines say we should be only treating patients with an NIH score above five. So we really don't have evidence for thrombectomy in these large vessel occlusions with low NIH. And in fact, if you look at the Hermes data, there's a total of 14 patients total in the world randomized to the new trials with an NIH of five or less currently. So there's a real paucity of data in this population. There's certainly a suggestion, if you sort of extrapolate the curves, that there may be benefit, but with 14 patients only randomized, we really need more data. So the current strategy, if you have a large vessel occlusion in a mild stroke, hopefully you've looked for one by doing the CTA, is that you should admit that patient and watch closely for neurological deterioration. If they deteriorate early in the window, in the first few hours, then they become eligible for thrombectomy, and you should certainly consider it in that patient. But we actually think that um, waiting is perhaps counterintuitive. There are a number of, of cohort studies now that have compared, looked at initial medical management with late rescue after deterioration versus immediate thrombectomy, and there seems to be better outcomes from these cohort studies. So we're moving forward with a trial design called Endolow, where we're going to hopefully randomize patients to uh, immediate thrombectomy versus initial medical management in these low NIH patients. So hopefully that trial will, will begin in the next year or two uh, as well. But I think it's important that we identify, uh, try to achieve some clinical trial data in this group so that we're not waiting around for deterioration, letting these infarcts grow bigger uh, before we treat them. In intracerebral hemorrhage, I'll just take a minute and talk to you a little bit about the CTA spot sign. Remember that hematoma expansion is a fabulous target for stroke physicians to potentially impact, we just need to develop a therapy for it, okay? And, and so the spot sign was a, as a CTA finding of essentially the leak point, the location of where the bleeding is occurring. Just like those plumbers seeing the leak in the plumbing system of your house, we can actually see the leak point on the CTA. And so we did a validation study demonstrating the, the importance of this for predicting hematoma expansion. And then we put this to the trial test in two randomized clinical trials, Spotlight and Stop It, um, where we randomized patients. We got a total of basically uh, 70 patients randomized with spot positive to factor 7A versus placebo, and also had a cohort of patients that were spot negative. The spot negative population did not grow their hematomas as predicted. There was no leak point seen on the CTA, while the spot positive group did grow. Unfortunately, however, we were not able to demonstrate in this study. It was underpowered. We had certainly feasibility issues with the study. We we're not able to show a difference between factor 7A and placebo in the presence of the spot sign. Why was that? Well, we had a couple of important learnings. We treated patients a bit late. In fact, the subgroup treated under three hours looked more promising. We saw a lot of hematoma expansion occurring mostly in patients imaged very early. This, we realized that this is an ultra-early uh, uh, um, that the opportunity is really ultra early with this, with this, uh, with disease of intracerebral hemorrhage. In these trials, we the average onset to scan time was 90 minutes, so pretty fast scanning. But the average scan time to giving study drug was another 90 minutes, a literally doubling of the amount of time. Way too slow from scan to needle in these trials. We uh, looked at this further in, uh, uh, by adding in what we call a post-dose CT. This is interesting because one of the great fears was that that time it takes to determine eligibility, 
consent the families and prepare a study drug would be an eternity for an intracerebral hemorrhage, right? Because these hematomas are literally growing over time. And so what we did was a post-dose CT scan immediately after study drug was given in one of the trials called Spotlight. Remarkably, almost all the growth occurred between the initial CT scan and the immediate post-dose CT with virtually no growth from the post-dose scan to the 24-hour scan. In fact, some, some of these hemorrhages actually shrunk. So this is a very front-end loaded uh, disease with, that needs a very front-end loaded treatment. This is the, uh, basically the plots of the hematoma volumes. They, you can see they shoot up early and then they quickly plateau off. So it's a, sort of a logarithmic curve of bleeding, if I, if I may. So, so what we've essentially been doing with our treatments for, for intracerebral hemorrhage with hemostasis is treating too close to the plateauing of the curve. We need to move our therapies earlier on the logarithmic curve for bleeding, and that's going to require probably an ultra-early two-hour trial, perhaps using CT ambulances. I don't know if there are any CT ambulance groups in the audience here, but we're very keen on applying this therapy uh, at 60 or 90 minutes or at most two hours from onset where we, we seem to see most of the hematoma growth occur. Moving to the third area, TPA. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about occlusion site residual flow. This is really an era, uh, I understand now 80,000 patients a year are treated with TPA in the United States. That's a fantastic number and that's actually increased since the EVT trials, which is a testament to, to that therapy having, still having its role. But I think that the challenge here with TPA is that we're learning about when it works well and when it doesn't. And so let me walk you through this. So this is my most controversial slide. I'm a stroke neurologist. Some stroke neurologists don't like me to show this slide, but I show it anyways. <laughs> this is a slide that basically starts to question whether TPA really has a role in patients without a visible occlusion. This was data from IST3. There are about 200 randomized patients in IST3, that's TPA versus placebo, where we have um, uh, information about vascular imaging. And uh, essentially, the, actually there were more than 200, but there were 200 patients that had no occlusion visible on CTA, and there's the, the TPA and the control arms. The outcomes were actually better with the control arm than with TPA in the no occlusion population, which starts to put into question, if we don't have a target for a thrombolytic, why are we giving thrombolytic? Now, there are exceptions to that rule. Lacunar strokes likely benefit from TPA. We know that from the original NINS trial. But it does start to shape sort of a, a rethinking a little bit of TPA. I use this particularly when I have a patient with a relative contraindication, where I've got a patient where I'm not super keen to treat. The absence of occlusion might sway me off the fence in this case, but this is, this is highly controversial and might need another trial. I'm not sure we'll ever do one. The other side of this equation is occlusion site. There is a huge difference with how TPA works in an MC occlusion versus an IC occlusion. Huge difference. We've shown this now repeatedly. We did this in a, a prospective cohort study. We did this in the IMS3 trial where 24-hour recanalization with IVTPA in the control arm of IMS3 was only about 25% for carotids and about 80% for the MCA. We've now uh, completed the intersect study. This was a study of baseline CTA, a IVTP administration follow-up CTA. That was a prospective cohort study, 600 patients. And what we're able to show is about a 20% early recanalization rate with TPA at one hour to about a 60% recanalization rate at seven hours, okay? So 20 to 70. We had some spontaneous patients that didn't get TPA as a bit of a control. You can see that's around five to, to 15 to 20% recanalization just spontaneously without TPA. What was really interesting in this data was the huge difference between carotids and distal M1 MCA. The sweet spot for intravenous TPA administration is the distal M1 portion of the MCA, right near the bifurcation point of the MCA. These clots are probably perfect for TPA, uh, and we saw recanalization rates of 40% early and close to 80% late. That's pretty good for TPA, for, for an MCA occlusion. But for the carotids, it was 5% early and 20% late. So much different situation for carotids. Residual flow is an interesting phenomenon. This is really about surface area. TPA is an enzyme. It needs to get in the clot and start breaking fibrin strands. This is a residual flow grading scale that we use with CTA. This is a grade zero on the left. You can see those are contrast particles. That red thing there in the middle, the dark red, that's the clot, that's the flow. You can see none of the contrast particles are getting through the clot on grade zero. Some contrast particles are getting flew into the clot. That's a called a ghosting effect. We call that grade one. 
And then some, in some cases, we see flow around the clot. That's a hairline lumen. That's grade 2. When you look at this in intersect, the patients with grade 1 and grade 2 residual flow had much more dramatic recanalization and early with TPA than those without residual flow, okay? And we've looked at this in, in other data sets, and it, it, it certainly uh, uh, seems to work pretty well. There is a quantitatable way of looking at this. You can actually take a cursor and put the cursor on the clot on the CTA and look for the highest Hounsfield unit you can find in the clot on the CTA. If you can find a Hounsfield unit over 90, that's contrast getting into the clot because a hyperdensine never gets over 70. So that's contrast, uh, some sort of, a, some contrast particles getting into the clot, that's a sign of residual flow and we saw threefold greater recanalization with TPA in the presence of residual flow. Is this stuff important? Well, you could debate that. Uh, I think it may have implications for transport decisions on these borderline patients and might have a role in bridging as we move forward with bridging trials with TPA in endovascular patients. The last bit I want to take in the last minute and a half here is EVT and talk just briefly. Aspects, uh, the way to think about aspects is trichotomy, good scan, fair scan, bad scan, okay? And it's really the poor scan group with the extensive early ischemic changes, the low aspect scores of zero to four that matter. We need a little bit more data from EVT trials in this group. We don't have statistically significant benefit there. And we did see a 20% symptomatic hemorrhage rate in the Hermes collaboration at low aspects. So these big core patients do have a risk for bleeding. Another approach to this is CT perfusion core estimation, and I won't spend too much time here, but this is the rapid approach. This is the Hermes collaboration looking at the size of the core on the x-axis there. This is in red, there's the control arm outcomes, the proportion of patients with good outcome. In the, in the black is the, TP, is the endovascular arm. You can see that the endovascular group always had better outcomes right through to even large cores. There's a small group of patients, even with big strokes, that seem to be achieving good outcomes uh, with endovascular treatment. Bruce Campbell has has refined this thinking and identified that young patients treated early, reperfuse early, seems to be the group of patients that can still achieve a good outcome despite a large core. The last thing I'll say is DON, uh, which has applied the uh, CTP criteria. This was a positive clinical trial using core criteria by CTP or MRI that had a successfully demonstrated benefit out to 24 hours. So CT perfusion is going to become more important now in the management and decision making. We use it for diagnostic uncertainty, and now we're going to need to use it for the late time window. So there's uh, my conclusion slide. Uh, you know, basically, uh, we need, uh, with minor stroke, uh, more trials are needed, but I think there's some impacts on treatment. Intracerebral hemorrhage, we need to move to early window. Major stroke, uh, I think we've learned a lot about TPA response, and in the vascular therapy, we've got some major implications from imaging uh, for decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I think we benefited from all the expertise you share and the pioneering work you've done. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. David Thaler, who we heard this morning in the debate, and he is going to uh, give us an update on the next steps following the FDA approval of the PFO closure device. David? Thank you very much. So uh, Dr. Hinchy got mad at me at lunch for not answering her question, but here's the answer. I think she's still here. Um, so hopefully she uh, will learn from it. So I'm going to try and do this without a pointer. Um, same disclosures. I haven't acquired anything new. It was October 28th uh, this year, uh, sorry, last year, <coughs> when the um, FDA finally approved the first device for uh, PFO closure. It was the Amplatzer PFO occluder. Um, I'm just going to read you the indication uh, wording here, and we're going to come back to bits of it in a little bit. But the, uh, the device is indicated for percutaneous transcatheter closure of a PFO to reduce the risk of recurrent stroke in patients predominantly between the ages of 18 and 60 who have had a cryptogenic stroke due to a presumed paradoxical embolism as determined by a neurologist and cardiologist following an evaluation to exclude known causes of ischemic stroke. That sounds fairly anodyne, but there's some interesting things in it that we'll come back to. 
So um, this is the issue now. Um, let's say that we accept that there's something in the uh, three now positive clinical trials which is sufficiently convincing that some strokes can be prevented in some people um, uh, with a, a mechanical vaccination against stroke, as some people have called this. Um, so uh, patient selection is going to be the important issue, and that's now up to us. So there are three dimensions of risk that we need to keep in mind. One is who has the disease. Number two is who has the disease and has a high risk of recurrence. And number three is who is likely to benefit from treatment. So let's see if we can um, address these. The first question is, is it a stroke? This is actually um, a, a series of slides that I like doing uh, for cardiologists, which I'm doing next week, actually. Um, ask a neurologist. That's the um, answer to that question. Um, because there are some things that look like strokes, um, which are strokes, and we call those strokes. And there are some things that look like strokes that are, in fact, not strokes, and we call those mimics. And we all know the various mimics. It's been, um, they've been brought up a little bit here today. Um, but it's important to make sure that we're treating a stroke. Um, it's also important not to forget that there are some things that come in not looking like strokes. And in fact, there are not strokes, and those we call not strokes. And then there are some things that come in that don't look like strokes, which in fact are strokes, and those are called chameleons. And they come in as uh, altered mental status or syncope or hypertensive emergency or something, and it turns out that, in fact, they're aphasic or they're neglectful or something. Um, and these uh, green things, uh, you don't need a neurologist for, right? It's, if it doesn't look like a stroke and it's not a stroke, it's pretty easy to figure out. If it looks like a stroke, and it is, so you're happy there, too. It's the pink ones where uh, neurologists need to get involved to decide if it's a stroke. So that's the first issue, stroke. The second question is, is it a cryptogenic stroke? Remember, we haven't yet got to the point of saying, this is a PFO stroke, as we might with a high-grade ipsilateral carotid stenosis or something say, this is a large artery stroke. So um, uh, the answer to this question is, ask a neurologist. Um, I'm also asked frequently to talk to cardiologists about, well, what tests do you need to do to, in a cryptogenic stroke patient? Um, which sort of begs the question, right? If it's a cryptogenic stroke patient, the test should already be done. So there's a lack of understanding in that question itself. Um, the problem with cryptogenic stroke, of course, is that the goalposts have been moving. Um, the RESPECT trial uh, was designed and enrolled its first patient in 2003. Um, but we know more about how to detect um, other, if you like, causes of cryptogenic stroke. There's prolonged um, cardiac monitoring for occult atrial fibrillation, which we're now better at finding. Less of a problem in younger patients, but still it's occasionally a problem. Um, Substenotic atherosclerosis, so a 49% ipsilateral carotid stenosis with, um, with an ulcer and a thrombus on top of it. Um, does that count or not? And then aortic source is important to look. So um, what counts as a cryptogenic stroke I think still is a moving target, and it's up to us to decide that this is, number one, a stroke, and number two, we've looked for everything we can, and we haven't come up with anything. Um, so uh, this is not news to this audience. Stroke is an observation. It's not a diagnosis. Um, as I implied before, there are many different ways people end up with stroke. Um, and this is particularly important in the uh, cryptogenic stroke population in whom a PFO is found. Finding a PFO in a patient with a cryptogenic stroke is not the same as making a diagnosis of paradoxical embolism. And the problem is the background prevalence of PFO is so high that you will find incidental PFOs inside a cryptogenic stroke population. So this is just some uh, sort of a thought experiment. Um, this here is the universe of cryptogenic stroke. There's some assumptions here. Let's say we find 40% prevalence of PFO in a cryptogenic stroke population. That's too high, right? The general population, let's say, in this uh, model is 25%, uh, roughly. So how many of the 40% of this population of cryptogenic stroke patients are, in fact, incidental rather than pathogenic? Um, if you just give the, if you look at the white 60% on the left, those are patients who don't have PFOs, and so therefore their cryptogenic strokes are not likely to be PFO related. They don't have a PFO. But amongst that population of non-PFO related cryptogenic stroke patients, they need a prevalence of PFO that matches the general population. So we've got to give them a prevalence of PFO of 25%. And when you do that, here we go. So now that 
the non-PFO related cryptogenic stroke population is on the <coughs> left. Uh, there's 75% that don't have PFOs, 25% do, and the leftover excess here are the ones which are probably the pathogenic ones. Um, so the question is, how can we divide this pink group when you're looking at an individual into those that belong into the hashed pink group, the incidental PFOs that belong to the non-PFO related cryptogenic strokes uh, and the pathogenic ones? So this was the um, uh, question that the ROPE study was, uh, was uh, trying to answer, risk of paradoxical embolism, that's what ROPE stands for. Um, I'm not going to go through the derivation of it all. Um, it's now available on MD Calc for free, um, and it gives you uh, some, uh, percentages and uh, risk of recurrence and various other things. But the rope score helps to, uh, using baseline variables available at the time of the index stroke, um, it helps you uh, give somebody a score. They get a score somewhere between 0 and 10, so it's an 11 point scale. And those um, points, you can see you get a point, for example, if you don't have hypertension. You get a point if you don't have diabetes. You get a point if you've never had a stroke or TIA before. You get a whole bunch of points if you're young and you lose a bunch if you're older. So high rope score patients um, are ones with few vascular risk factors and they are young. Low rope score patients have more vascular risk factors and they're older. Um, and it turns out that the prevalence of PFO by rope score is very different. So in the zero to three rope scores, older patients, vascular risk factors, the prevalence of PFO um, is about 22% or so, which is exactly what you would expect from the general background population, which is different from the prevalence in the high rope score groups, which are nine or 10 or so. And you can see the prevalence there is over 70%. That's way too many, which means that the high rope score patients probably have a whole bunch of pathogenic PFOs. And using some assumptions in Bayes' theorem, we can, um, we can identify the so-called PFO attributable fraction, or in English, that means the likelihood that the, you dis that the discovered PFO was related to the index stroke. So you can see in the low rope score group, the PFO attributable fraction is essentially zero. There are not statistically any or too many PFOs in that group. There aren't an excess, there isn't an excess, and so therefore the likelihood in a low rope score patient that their PFO is related to their stroke is essentially zero. In the high rope score group, on the other hand, the um, PFO attributable fraction is almost 90%, statistically. And there are lots of individual patients that will violate um, your sense of what's really going on, but um, statistically, this is a pretty good way to disaggregate that pink bunch of PFOs in cryptogenic stroke patients into those that are more or less likely to have had a pathogenic PFO. So people have said to me, well, right, so if you know the rope score, then you know who has a high-risk PFO. And I think it's important to understand what the rope score is trying to do. Um, if you take the analogy with atrial fibrillation, the rope score is not the chads vasc 2 score. It does not predict um, the risk of recurrence. Um, it's much more like an EKG or a Holter monitor. It helps to make the diagnosis of PFO relatedness. It does not tell you that those are the ones that need to be treated, not yet, nor does it tell you that there are higher risk of recurrence, and in fact, here are those PFO attributable fractions by rope score again. The risk of recurrence at two years um, goes down with the higher rope score. So the higher rope score is actually associated with a lower risk of recurrence. All that means is that the non-PFO related stroke mechanisms, which are likely in the lower rope score groups, are riskier than the PFO related recurrent mechanisms. So PFO is a relatively um, less risky stroke mechanism, at least as far as recurrence goes, then are the other cryptogenic mechanisms within a cryptogenic stroke population. Um, so are there baseline variables that predict recurrent uh, stroke, and do those predictors differ by rope score? You might expect in the low rope score patients who are, if you like, regular stroke patients and the PFO is incidental, there shouldn't be anything about the nature of the PFO that predicts recurrence or anything like that. Um, and the high rope score uh, patients where PFO was thought to be related to the index stroke, if there's something about the PFO that's related to the recurrence, that's where you would expect to find it. The PFO characteristics should be predictive in the high rope score groups, uh, but not in the low rope score groups. And so we did find some variables that predicted recurrence, and they did disaggregate according to the rope score. Um, this is a little bit confusing, and I'm going to go through it very quickly, but the publication is there for you if you need it. On the left uh, column, or the middle column, I guess, is the, or the low rope score group. Uh, in the high rope score group, we dichotomize them here on the right. 
And you can see, for example, um, that at the very bottom, hypermobile interatrial septum, which is, um, uh, which is a much better term than atrial septal aneurysm, although it's saying the same thing. Um, if you have a, an ASA or hypermobile septum, your risk of recurrence, if you're in the high rope score group, is doubled. So ASA does predict recurrence <coughs> in a high rope score group, but not in the low rope score group, which is reassuring. It kind of tells us that we're separating this population in what seems to be a reasonable way. Shunt size, which is um, another topic of interest to many people, also uh, sep uh, is predictive of recurrence in the high rope score group and not in the low rope score group. That's another PFO characteristic, which is influential in the high rope score group, but not the low rope score group. The problem is that there's a tripling of the risk of recurrence in patients who had small shunts, not large shunts. And as Huxley said in one of the debates in the Sheldonian Theater about Darwin, the tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful theory on the sword of fact. So it might be true that you want the big shunts to be the big bad ones, but we couldn't show that on, uh, in the rope data, and we'll come to uh, treatment effect in a second. There are reasons for this. Um, I think uh, it's a problem, and a lot of people don't believe it, um, and there's two possibilities. Either it's wrong or it's right, and we can talk about why I think it might be right um, later on. So what are the treatment options that we have uh, for cryptogenic stroke and PFO? Um, first of all, as was suggested before, this is all statistical, right? And we presume that there's a um, PFO-related stroke. Therefore, every one of these patients is a stroke patient, and they need to be treated as if they're uh, stroke patients and not cured um, by some mechanical means. Um, so everybody needs to have long-term, forever, guideline-directed secondary prevention recommendations, statins, smoking, exercise, diet, the whole thing. Everybody should be on an antithrombotic treatment of one sort or another. We're not going to address um, the, the differences between the antithrombotic treatments. Um, and then there are the PFO-specific therapies. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, language again, um, and there's nothing in this language about the subgroups, as I've just been suggesting, ASA and large shunts and stuff. Um, so do we know who benefits from closure? And importantly, if you think you're answering that question, you're also um, by implication answering, and therefore who doesn't benefit? And that's where I think the problem comes uh, from the data. In the RESPECT trial, a lot has been made about the um, differential, the apparent differential treatment effect in those who had uh, different shunt sizes or the presence or absence of an ASA. And in the RESPECT data, the larger shunts seem to have a um, better uh, treatment effect, um, favors PFO closure than those without a large shunt. Uh, and the same was true for the ASA in the RESPECT data. And you can see, importantly, look at the interaction p-value, which is really what gives you um, the information about whether there's a, a treatment effect, a differential treatment effect based on that variable. And these are significant or almost significant um, uh, from the interaction p-value. So some people have said, look, we know now it's the ones with the uh, large shunts in the ASAs, those are the ones that need to be treated. The problem is that the PC trial, which is a little brother of the RESPECT trial, was done in Europe with um, about a third of the patients. Um, with regard to ASA, it was exactly the opposite. It was the ones who did not have an ASA, who seemed to have a um, beneficial treatment effect from closure. Um, this is the recently presented reduced trial. Um, they don't have ASA data, but they do have shunt size data. And you can see that the moderate to large shunts on the bottom were uh, significantly improved or uh, by uh, treatment with uh, the PFO closure device, whereas the um, small ones were not. There was not a significant p-value. And people have said, well, look, this is evidence that we know that it's the, um, it's the large chance that need to be treated. If you look at the point estimates, though, they're almost identical. And the, um, the, the error bars are obviously hugely overlapping. But importantly, look at the interaction p-value which is 0.77, which is nowhere near significant. So there's nothing about these data which should lead you to think that uh, large shunts are better treated um, with PFO closure than small shunts, even though some people have made that argument. Similarly, I should point out that the closed trial, people have made the argument too. Now, in, in fact, in the editorial in the New England Journal, um, they said, look, now we know that it's the large shunts that need to be treated because the closed trial was positive. The closed trial only included patients with large shunts. It didn't include patients with small shunts, and so therefore we can't make any observation based on that trial. 
Um, so uh, just back up here again. This is again the individual uh, patient data meta-analysis that um, we did, which included a look at shunt size. And when you added the first three trials together, uh, the point estimates were about the same. There was absolutely no suggestion of differential treatment effect when looking at the um, interaction p-value um, uh, from the uh, combined uh, trials, the early trials, not the more recent ones. So those, for those people who say, okay, that's all fine, I still think it makes sense that it's the ASAs and the large shunts, those are the ones I'm gonna treat. The problem with making that argument is that you're also therefore saying, and I'm not gonna treat those with small shunts and who don't have an ASA, and they were included in the trials, and we don't know that they don't benefit. So by withholding treatment, which is what the implication is from these patients, um, you may not be doing them a service. Um, these, this has not been uh, published, but this has been presented at ISC um, uh, this year, no, it was last year, I think. Um, there was a, a trend toward an improved treatment effect in those who had the high rope scores within the clinical trial data, um, but the p-value was uh, only getting close to significant. And the spread of rope scores within the uh, clinical trials was quite narrow, so that might, be a, might have been a problem. So who has the disease? I think a neurologist defined cryptogenic stroke uh, with a high rope score. I think that helps you get to the right patients to decide who are the ones who are likely um, uh, to have the disease that you're interested in. Who has the disease and a high risk of recurrence? I'd say it's controversial. I think the atrial septal aneurysm seems reasonably secure. Um, the shunt size thing is still an open question, I would say. And importantly, who is likely to benefit? That's what we really want to know. Um, and it seems like those patients who are respectable, um, and by that I mean the ones who would fit within the inclusion and exclusion criteria of the RESPECT trial, and one might also say now reducible and closable. Um, those were the other more recent trials. Um, so what do we know for sure? PFO is related to cryptogenic stroke, but not all PFOs are pathogenic. The recurrence risk of PFO-related stroke is about 1% per year, something that was observed in the trials over um, several years of follow-up. Predictions of recurrence include prior stroke, hypermobile septum, and a small shunt, maybe. Um, devices are low risk, but they're not no risk. Rope scores can identify a likelihood of PFO-relatedness, and PFO closure is associated with fewer recurrent strokes uh, than medical therapy alone. So again, uh, importantly, uh, the, in, the labeling says for patients predominantly between the ages of 18 and 60. They didn't say at the FDA between 18 and 60, even though those are, um, that was the population that was studied. It leaves open the possibility of seeing an incredibly healthy 70-year-old who had a paradoxical embolism coming back from their skiing vacation or something. Um, so it's not age restricted, although it's suggested. Um, uh, due to presumed paradoxical embolism, I think you can get there with the rope score. And importantly, and I think this is unique amongst FDA labeling, the um, specialty um, who is meant to make the diagnosis um, is a combination of uh, two different specialties, which is neurology and cardiology. Um, it may not come to this, but it is uh, possible for cardiologists and neurologists to work together. Two neurologists, two cardiologists living it up in um, somewhere, I can't remember where that meeting was. Um, so this is a guide that I hand to all cardiologists that I meet who are interested in learning about PFOs. Not every dizzy spell is a TIA, that's it. There's nothing on the inside, it's just a label. Um, and I think this uh, gets to the point that cardiologists need to um, collaborate with uh, neurologists, involve neurologists in the diagnosis. Um, we need to exclude other, other common cryptogenic causes continue aggressive risk factor modification after closure, continue antithrombotic medication after closure, involve patients in the decision making, um, and uh, the inter-society position statements I think need to be written and updated. Lots of outstanding issues including are there device specific risks and benefits and what do we do with older patients and pregnant patients and silent strokes, there are a lot of things that still need to be figured out. And this is a photograph um, taken by a, a northeast um, vascular neurologist, not me, but somebody that many of you know. Thank you.
Thank you, David. That was a fantastic presentation. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Peter Panagos, who many of you know, he previously worked here in Rhode Island and was responsible for uh, many of the uh, stroke system changes. Dr. Panagos is currently a professor of emergency medicine and neurology at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he's the director of neurovascular emergency in the Division of Emergency Medicine and co-director of the Barnes Jewish Hospital, Washington University Stroke Network. Uh, he currently serves as the co-chair of Mission Lifeline Stroke and vice chair of the Stroke Council Leadership Committee and is gonna update us on that uh, statement. Thank you very much. Slide advancer. Am I missing? Does anyone have? Is it here? Yes. All right. I passed the test. So thank you very much. It's great to be back here to New England as a native New Hampshireite um, and um, recovering Rhode Island uh, native. I am. Um, I shouldn't say that. Just, my my wife's, or wife is not here, so she prevents me from saying a lot of things if she were here. So. Um, I have the really distinct honor and actually daunting task of batting third in that lineup that you just heard from. So I will try to do my best here today. And I assured staff, including Abigail, that I would stay on time. I have 20 minutes. And I little but to the other speakers is AHA staff, for every minute you go over your 20 minutes, is going to sneak into your room before you go to bed tonight and remove one of your pillows. So I actually did the math. I went up there. I have uh, two queen beds with 10 pillows. So I, could, so I think I have about eight minutes additional time, um, or, or maybe nine minutes. But then I did the math again, and two of those are those little decorative things, and I don't want to be left with those because I know they would leave those, so I have about eight minutes over. So um, so we have about a half an hour, so you, you fine with that, Abigail? So we're all set. All right, very good. So my wife would have talked me out of that one, too. So disclosures. With all that said, you know, a little history and background. I'm a history major. I like to kind of talk about where we've been and where we've been for Mission Lifeline Stroke and for stroke pre-hospital triage, and what I'm going to present you today is outdated. Um, it's, it's old science and it's not even a year old. Um, and, and you heard amazing talks this morning um, from, from Andrew um, and, um, and Matthew who gave a very good description of really the kind of the state of art, what's going on for pre-hospital triage. And Mission Lifeline Stroke, which was presented back in February in Houston, um, was really our the best attempt to try to get something down to really trigger conversation within the stroke EMS and emergency medicine community, and I think it's done that. And having reviewed some of the, tr the abstracts for this um, upcoming IC meeting, uh, more than half of those are descriptions and people's stories on how they have developed innovative ways to triage patients efficiently between hospitals. So, you know, I think we have, have, have uh, achieved what we attempted to achieve, and it's not the end-all discussion, but we'll kind of go over this in a little bit more because it's important to understand where we've been to figure out where we're going. And at the end of this, just to keep you on the edge of your seat, at the end of the 30, 40 minutes of my talk, I will, um, I'm going to announce the winner of the debate this morning. After, you know, on that app that everyone downloaded, it actually ca it calculated text that you and sent to your friends, and, and we know who won the debate, and it's really kind of clear. So look forward to that. So we know, you know, faster treatment is better treatment. I don't really have to go into that. This is the choir here, and we know um, that that makes and leads to better care. Uh, we know that you know maybe up to a, a quarter of patients that come through our front doors are eligible for IV thrombolysis, and maybe and that's as a moving target. You know, 10, 15, maybe 20 percent, or maybe less, depends where you practice, may be eligible for endovascular thrombectomy. Um, and so the question always is, you know, why doesn't EMS just do the right thing and bring us the right patients all the time and bring the other patients to the other places that they need to go? But it's it's a complicated process, and we're asking a lot of our EMS providers. And in the past, we've just been asking them, can you figure out if this is a stroke within some time window, and can you bring them to a stroke center that has some system in place? But now we're asking EMS to do a lot more complicated thought process and a thought process and a, and a process that even in the emergency department is quite complicated and not always apparent and easy to figure out. So you know, in the, bit, in the beginning, in 2014, um, soon after the announcement of comprehensive stroke center criteria and, and the pathway to become a comprehensive center, the American Heart Association got together a group of the CSC EMS routing committee uh, that I happen to be part of, and we tried to figure out at that time, and this is pre-endovascular uh, revolution. This is 2015, 14, not even that long ago, but it's changed dramatically since then. And we were trying to come up with some time-based and some not even severity-based, just kind of you know, patients who would be included for IV thrombolysis 
to not. And we even threw in, just to kind of you know, be a little controversial, maybe um, wake up strokes or patients who may have suspicion of hemorrhage. We discussed this amongst all types of providers across the country and couldn't come up with much of a conclusion. We even went as far as saying, well, you know, urban and rural much different way. We need to have two different protocols because what exists in an urban setting may not be applicable to an area that's low resource. Uh, maybe we have to have two protocols and apply these individually. So we started to start thinking about triage based upon time, severity, and maybe even hemorrhagic suspicion, but we know that is difficult to prove. And that's kind of sat and festered and didn't really get anywhere because we really couldn't decide on where to go. Uh, with these ideas, and there, since they were so controversial, and the evidence was lacking. And then the arrival of comprehensive centers came along, and thrombectomy-capable stroke centers, and really now we are left with decisions that we need to make, um, how to get the right patient to the right center, and you can see the many different ways a patient can make it into your front door, and now we have many options our patients can, can arrive to, comprehensive centers, primary centers with that asterisk of that thrombectomy-capable stroke center soon to be uh, apparent in, in on your front door as of January 1st, 2018, whatever that is going to look like in our communities, um, acute stroke ready hospitals and then our critical access hospitals. And all the factors that determine where we're going to bring these patients um, are still in play. So now we're asking for more. We're saying EMS, figure out, is this a stroke? And then we want you to figure out, you know, is this, what type of stroke is this? Is this a large vessel occlusion severe stroke? And if they are, bring them to the right hospital with the right services available 24-7. You should know what those are. Um, so that's, that's very challenging for EMS. And there's a lot of challenges out there 2015, 2015 and beyond. You know, we still first have to identify stroke, and that's not easy. Um, our ability with high fidelity to identify stroke in a pre-hospital setting is not perfect. It's still, ch uh, um, it's still challenging. Transporting large vessel occlusions to, to hospitals that don't have capability may cause harm. That's the last thing we want to do when we go to work in the morning is cause harm to a patient. But also bypassing local hospitals may pati place patients outside any existing treatment windows, and that could cause harm too. Last thing you wanted to do when you woke up that morning and went to work. And, no, and we, we know the severity tools that are out there, and we've heard about that. None of them are perfect, and we don't want to miss patients, but we want to over, you know, avoid over-diagnosing patients who are not eligible for EVT therapy um, because we don't want to overburden our comprehensive centers. And the truth and data, as we are hearing today, are really evolving. And when we all go to Los Angeles um, in, in a few months, um, we're going to hear a whole different story and a set of experiences that may change how we look at how we treat patients in a pre-hospital setting. So we know endovascular therapy is now the new standard of care in certain select stroke patients. Um, it, in the, though this is 2004 data, there's still, and we saw this earlier, the mine is color. Um, the other one was black and white, I have to, so no, no, nothing on that one. So it shows that there's still disparities in access to care, um, and see, nothing goes above the, the border in Canada. So I'm not sure what's going on up there. You guys don't have any, <laughs> maybe we can get you some funding for some color up next year. So. <laughs> So, I, I, that, my wife would have talked me out of that one too. So, <laughs> so, um, so there's still a lot of um, lot of regions in the country that don't have access to endovascular care either by ground or air within 60 minutes. You can see northern northern New England. Um, look at that graphics. And I may actually have got pieces of Delaware and Pennsylvania in there, but we don't want to. We, we don't. We didn't, We won't include them then. So there's still parts of our own area uh, in your own communities that don't have access to care quickly. And this is the new normal for endovascular therapy, and that's, you know, the number needed to treat compared to IV, PPA is there, and you know the trials, um, we've heard data um, and, and these reported before, that the number needed to treat for good outcomes for endovascular therapy in all the trials is quite good and fares very well compared with IV therapy alone, but most of these trials were facilitated thrombolysis with endovascular therapy. So challenges and opportunities, you know, how do we give this access of this care to all patients? If I'm fly fishing in the set second Connecticut Lake in northern New Hampshire, one of my favorite places to be, and I have a stroke, I shouldn't be penalized for, for, for fishing. You know, I should, should have, I should have access to care, though I may, so you may say, well, if you chose to go to a remote area, you kind of pay the price. But with all that said, you know, if you have a, a, a stroke in, at, you know, at Fenway Park and you have access to Longwood Center, um, you, you really should have fairly equal access to care, or at least consideration of care. Um, Thrombectomy-capable hospitals are clustered. We all know that. We've seen the maps of that. And we know and we've heard, and we'll hear some more tomorrow, that inter-hospital transport times are slow, and door in, door out, though in our best attempts um, are an hour once you go in, get registered, and seen in, um, at a hospital. 
And there's still knowledge gaps within my specialty, within emergency medicine and neurology on how to transport patients officially, efficiently. And I have conversations um, continue with my neurologist about the realities and pragmatism of, of EMS care and how great thoughts sometimes don't translate into policy uh, and regulation in a pre-hospital setting. Existing stroke systems of care in our region just sat through the main Vermont, New Hampshire stroke systems of care talk during lunch um, are, are changing right in front of us and the challenges and the geography and the resources um, are changing every year so you have to be adaptable. Um, and we know that most of the patients that we see in a pre-hospital setting are going to be able to be managed at the nearest closest primary stroke center. So how do we do this? So Mission Lifeline Stroke was formed in 2015 really kind of to address some of these issues that I, that I brought up. And we had a number of goals that we wanted to initiate. And the first one, the lowest hanging fruit, I think, was develop some EMS stroke specific transport transfer algorithm, not a bypass, but it's a really a facilitation of care al algorithm. We had a number of other goals, but we chose one that potentially would be easy, had a very um, strong uh, community membership um, across all specialties uh, within the healthcare system. And our process was really to kind of get the membership together, listen to constituents in, in different parts of the region, recognize evolving data, use evidence if we had it, and, and, and lack of evidence was not necessarily, not necessarily evidence, and, aware, and be aware of limitations, barriers, to try to come up with something that we could use as a template to get out there for um, systems and, and regions to use to maybe base their local protocols off that we, they knew were somewhat, somehow based upon a thoughtful process. And we can go through that process and that, and obviously there were issues with that, but we wanted to get something done out there and stimulate discussion. I think we were successful for that. So we'll go over the overview real quickly on that. I have um, 20, 25 more minutes, I'm fine. So. Uh, I borrow this from Lee Swam. This, you know, all stroke is not created equal, and we know that now. We have many different types of stroke options and stroke center care. Um, and even for centers that, that advertise themselves as capable, we know the capability and capacity of those systems changes day to day and sometimes hour to hour. So that's, that's a challenge for our EMS providers. Um, and we know, you know, the question is to bypass or triage or not to bypass. That's the question. We know if we're taking a ship from um, Baja, California to Philadelphia, we could, the nearest, closest, quickest way is through the Panama Canal, but at the expense of not seeing the Cape of Horn at the tip of South Africa if you go the long way. So, you know, by going the long way sometimes comes at risk and, um, and sometimes comes at, at leaving things on the table or actually um, missing something that may have been useful. Um, so, you know, bypassing um, is something that is not a clear science. So. I'll go through these pretty quickly. We, um, you know, stroke still is a high, high impact, low frequency pre-hospital event. We know that probably less than 5% of the patients EMS is bringing into the hospital are transported for stroke. Um, because it's a low incidence event, um, it's challenging to get screening tools that everyone feels comfortable with continually. So therefore, if we're going to come up with something, it has to be easily remembered um, and not doesn't take a lot of training because, you know, those training hours are limited for EMS. And then, you know, this, we heard er, the discussion this morning about the hypothetical near-perfect pre-hospital stroke scale that, you know, if you wanted something that was 99% sensitive with a good specificity, given a 5% disease, uh, five percent disease prevalence um, for all stroke, not just LVO, you know, with a high predictive value, you know, even if it was ideal, you'd only be capturing 51% of your patients. So um, using one scale to fit all is not necessarily um, going to work. So, you know, life is full of difficult decisions. And I put these up here um, just because I like Google. Um, and so, so what we're going to do in a pre-hospital setting is, is, is a difficult decision. So the algorithm in the next few minutes I'm going to go into is tell you what it is. It's not something that's prescription. It's not something that, that it fits all sizes and it may not fit your community. Um, um, but it's something that's evidence-based based upon the limited evidence that's available that's growing right in front of our eyes for pre-hospital triage. Um, this is what it looks like. There's some copies outside, and it's on, on and I'll give you the web link later. Um, but it's you know it's, uh, designed to be fairly straightforward. The left side is really the background data behind it, small text. Don't expect anyone to read that, but you can look at it outside. And then the right side, I'll break, kind of break down. On-scene recommendations, really the same. Basic EMS care, ABCs, recognize finger stick, time last known well, all kind of basic EMS tenants of care. Um, and then we kind of break it down. So the left side is initial stroke care, really no significant changes from any protocols 
I would expect in your region is you, you know EMS dispatch suspicion of stroke or something that could be a stroke on scene recognition evaluation stabilization and doing so, and then doing some sort of stroke um, screen wh whatever you use in your local plan to decide if it's a stroke or not if it's not a stroke you transfer as regional protocol and if it is um, then you go down a different pathway if it you think it's a stroke then at this point you identify time last known well um, or s and symptom discovery and then perform and document some sort of severity scale and we were fairly clear about not uh, choosing one or the other because we know there's not one and many different regions are really kind of um, bedded um, and, and, and tied to one particular severity scale. So choose one, be comfortable with it, and then track its progress over time. The next part is that if uh, LVO is suspected and you don't suspect one and they screen negative in your severity, then you know, transfer to the center of your, of your choosing based upon your regional plan. But if you had a, a positive um, severity scale, then, and your screen was positive, your last known well was under six hours. Again, this was written prior to Hermes uh, analysis, prior to um, um, forthcoming data on, on using rapid software. Tra and the transport time adds uh, less than or equal to 15 minutes. Now was a controversial number just because um, there are many different numbers out there, but 15 minutes was the only number we could come from um, that it was from, uh, from, a, from a written study, and that was a, a study um, that was um, written by Jess Saver and colleagues that looked at uh, delay in tra treatment time, and for every minute um, that you delayed treatment, you would actually lose a day of, non, of, of non-disabled um, life. Um, and at, for every 15 minutes um, that you delayed care, you would, um, you would lose a month of uh, disease-free um, um, status as, as a patient. So that was the only thing we could find, and that's why we chose that number. And then, and if and a transport to the CSC does not place the patient outside an existing window, um, then you transport to your CSC. Um, if no, then go to the nearest closest. So the key assumptions that are out there is, you know, we have to balance the harms and risks of transporting these patients to centers and, 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 uh, and rerouting by centers that may be closer. We have to figure out plans that does not disrupt EMS. Um, we know certain small townships have one or two ambulances, and when you take an ambulance off offline, it really puts that community at risk for further uh, for further EMS calls, and then they have to do mutual share, and there's really kind of a, a domino effect that occurs in the EMS world. We know there are many more primary stroke centers um, than um, than, than comprehensive centers in the United States, and then acute stroke ready hospitals are growing, and then these thrombectomy capable centers are, you know, was not something we were even considering at the time. And then overcrowding to the comprehensive centers is something we are intimately aware of. I work at a large urban hospital, and we don't want more patients, we want less patients, but we want the right patients. So how to do that um, in, in a very th pragmatic way. No severity tools were superior. There are really no severity tools to, to figure out who's having a hemorrhage. And that was a question I wanted to talk to uh, our, our folks this morning is, you know, how does, where does hemorrhage fit into these um, severity um, decisions? And we all know that every time we try to predict um, who is having an ICH or subarachnoid as they roll through, we, we, we are, our chance of being right is about 50%. So there's no great hemorrhage severity tool out there. Um, and you can kind of read some of the other issues out there. Um, and we know that delays lead to worse outcome. So. So what are the next steps using, using this? Well, y you know, it's a high-level framework. We wanted it out there for, for systems to look at, debate, um, and really kind of critique, um, and then adapt it to their own system. Um, we wanted, you know, in order to make something work, you have to identify and engage your region stroke uh, stakeholders, physicians, nurses, EMS, your Department of Health, um, uh, hospital systems, hospital associations, because this is a contentious issue when you talk about rerouting patients um, around hospitals or outside systems, that can become a very politically charged question. And then anyone else who's interested in the care of patients in your community. And then you have to identify and assess your current practice, um, you figure what resources you have, how you're gonna use those resources, look at gaps in care, and really kind of adapt it to your own community. And then the next step is when you implement your own uh, pra um, system or, or triage algorithm, you develop a regional plan, tailor it to your local resources. In, in St. Louis, we have two comprehensive centers under the Joint Commission. We have five level one centers under the state of Missouri, which are essentially endovascularly capable centers. So we have to come up with ways of making all that work, and everyone else is a primary stroke center. Implement your plan, integrate a rapid cycle of quality, so if you know something is working, you can kind of continue working. If you know it's not, you can change direction, and then adapt, 
assess and um, base your change on pra best practice. So, you know, what we're doing in our, our region now is kind of tracking our impact as we changed our pre-hospital triage plan, um, and we're trying to improve it continually. And I, and I, I hear those stories here um, uh, just around this room as people are talking. So, you know, this area is rich for research, and we've heard some great research projects, and there are many in, in, in the pipeline right now. You know, which pre-hospital large vessel to, uh, tool, uh, LVL tool is the best? We don't know. They haven't really been compared head to head, and inter-rater reliability is still something of question on many of our minds. What are the impact of using these scores to reroute patients? Uh, we think we know the answer to that, but it may not be what we expect. And which LVO patients respond to an endovascular therapy? Or I think we're learning more about that, but there's certain you know, pathways about you know, direct to the cath lab, avoiding IV thrombolysis, uh, facilitated thr thrombolysis, different catheters, um, different time windows that are still unknown. And are all hospitals created equal? Just because you say you do a good job doesn't mean you do. And maybe EMS in the community needs to know who those hospitals are, so that means transparency of data. And then trials comparing drip and chip versus you know, direct uh, to the mothership. And then other things, just use your imagination. I think we're in a really ripe area for research in this field. So next steps in Mission Lifeline. We've been updating this. We've already updated a couple times, adding thrombectomy-capable centers and severity scales. I've just lost one pillow. And, um, <laughs> and with all that said, you know, this, is the, this, is the, um, this is the link for it. You can also get one outside and download your copy if you want it. So with all that said, I'd like to thank co-chairs of Mission Lifeline Stroke, the uh, Mission Lifeline Stroke membership um, staff check, that help put all this together and continually um, kind of keep their volunteers moving in a, in a forward direction. I'd like to thank Matt for his defense this morning. I'd like to thank Andrew for his critical mind. And the winner is, it was a complete tie because you were both correct. So I know that's a cop out, but you know, it was a wonder wonderful discussion. So with all that said, one minute over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Panagos. At this time, I'd like to invite all our panelists to come up for questions. We have about uh, 10 minutes for questions and answers from the audience. I'm going to start off with a question for anybody on the panel here. There was uh, an article that just came out in Stroke, um, and I might be misremembering which country this was from, but I think it was in Germany. They um, are now directly transporting patients with stroke scale scores of 10 or higher directly to the angiography suite. In, a, in other words, bypassing, if you mind me using that word, bypassing mm -hmm. CT and CTA. Uh, what they found in their study, single center, was that 79% uh, of those patients had a large vessel occlusion, uh, which they felt was a good hit rate. Um, some patients had hemorrhages, which wasn't hurt by going up there. Um, and their median door to groin puncture time, or mean uh, door to groin puncture time, went from 53 minutes down to 21 minutes. What do you think about that as a protocol, bypassing yet another level? Um, yeah, we actually, this, this actually had some debate about this actually in STAIR on, on Monday with a large group of people. One of the challenges with going straight to angio is that CT technology for angio is still in evolution. And if you talk to some neuroradiologist, they'll tell you that that, that detector system yet isn't ideal. And I, I would worry about missing little subarachnoid hemorrhages and things with that. So I'm not sure, A, the technology is quite there yet. Uh, I'm in a socialized health system. That's a total non-starter for me. I have my angio suites are constantly in use. And there's no way that we could be bringing in hemorrhages to go straight to angio. So I don't even get to have that conversation in Canada if I wanted to. But uh, I think that there are, there are some issues around the technology at this point. The reality is you can actually have a door, re 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 door to groin puncture under 60 minutes with a CTCTA. Uh, you can streamline your system where you're giving CTA 15, 20 minutes from onset, you know, triggering the cath lab team on CTA at the 20 minute mark and, you know, groin puncture at the 40 minute mark. So I'm not sure how much it really adds and it certainly will avoid those, those false positives, right, or false negatives. Yeah, um, so we, we, uh, we've we had the same discussion at our institution, and I was unfortunately it was a, a, a high volume of roll enroller for IMS3 of patients with large NI stroke scales who had no LVO on initial angiogram, so I kind of have a personal experience with that. 
with all that said, you know, from the pragmatic standpoint, from emergency medicine or EMS, I think going straight up to, to the cath lab, ha, you know, has some issues on, on patient management. You know, who's meeting that patient in the lab? You know, if the proceduralist is getting ready to do the procedure, someone needs to be managing the patient because potentially some of these patients are unstable. So that system has to be well designed and well oiled, and someone has to be managing the patient as well as, as while the team is getting prepared to perform the thrombectomy. Um, so I think those are issues that you have to take into consideration. Certainly if a patient's coming from a primary stroke center and they already know it's an LVO and it's been a short period, then, then I see no problem with that. But I think for a direct bypass, it's a challenge. I have a question from the Dr. J. Rama. Hi, um, is this on? Um, I'm uh, Mahesh J. Raman from uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, Brian, to your point, so I'm a neurointerventionalist for those of you that don't know. And sort of from my perspective, um, and Don Heck, who's a colleague, is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, says it very well. Whatever time you think you save by skipping a CTA before you start the angiogram, you make up for by the procedure taking longer. I think that if you have a CTA, and I'm gonna a shameless plug for multi-phase CTA, which we switched to in November of last year, if you have a good CTA, multi-phase CTA, you've already planned the entire case out in your mind before you start. So I know whether the carotid is a medial or lateral bifurcation, I know whether there's a tonsillar loop, I know which size stent retriever I'm gonna use, uh, do I have a carotid stenosis? So I personally think that you may think you're saving yourself time to start the procedure, but ultimately your time to reperfusion and your case time may be longer because you may not have thought through all of the anatomy and especially with multi-phase CTA being able to see the back end of the clot and know exactly what the clot length is and where you want to position your device. So I would make the ca argument that you know time to angio may be shorter, but time to reperfusion, especially as Andrew says in a well-oiled machine, basically I can review the CT and the CTA and plan the entire procedure while other stuff is happening. So that's my take on that. Do we have any other questions? No? Okay, we'll move on. Thank you very much, everyone.